Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the OSINT Curious Webcast Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Michael Hoffman. Welcome to the show. I'd like to introduce you to some of the co-hosts that I have here, and we have a huge number. I think we have the most we've ever had for a webcast. Um, let's just go around the horn here. Uh, why don't we go with Laurent Bodo? Say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. And Nick's. Hi, everyone. It's Nick Sintel. Thanks for watching or listening. Oh, very nice. I like that you had that there. <laughs> Kirby Plus is. Say hi to everybody for us. Hey, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming back to another show. Yeah. Ray? Ray Baker. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Cool. And my bald buddy, Nico. Say hi, Dutch Ocean Guy. Hi, Dutch Ocean Guy. Nico here. <laughs> and we are very happy to have a special guest on this webcast, uh, Chris Poulter. You might know him as OSINT Combine on Twitter. So hi to everybody, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, I hope everyone's staying safe out there around the world. Yeah, safe and alone. <laughs> uh, just some things to get out of the way. Uh, we are all on quarantine here in different locations, and we're all doing okay. Um, we have a bunch of people that are attending us and attending live, and this will, of course, be uh, put on the web a little bit later on. So um, let's let's get down to it. Let's talk to Chris about well all the things OSIN. Now, uh, for those of you that don't know Chris, uh, he is from Australia, and he's a really nice guy. Just despite of that, uh, he also. <laughs> <laughs> he's got uh, a great website hosting combine out there that has uh, a bunch of tools one of which we're going to be talking about later on in the broadcast uh, but he's a terrific supporter of open source intelligence and a long time uh, OSINTer himself and a pretty badass programmer if I don't if I can say that uh, Chris why don't you tell us a little bit about your history about how you got into OSINT and and uh, start us off yeah, thanks, Marcus. So, um, look, I, I, I guess long time ago, started out in the IT world. And that's where the, uh, I guess, the dev development skills and those sort of things came from. And then moved in and um, joined the military and, and spent a long time uh, sort of in a, a different part, uh, you know, in the army. And then um, those sort of two worlds collided uh, not too long ago and, um, and pushed those together and, and I guess found a nexus between some of the stuff we were doing. And uh, that led me down the OSIN path and just to, to, to pun, you know, uh, really curious and, um, you know, just sort of uh, stayed in it. And, um, yeah, I, I just love everything sort of can get from the open source Intel side. And, and that sort of drove around, you know, what we can, uh, collect for free and, uh, and, and push out there. And, and, you know, that sort of really drove the interest and, and kept me going. And so eventually got out of the military and, um, yeah, started OSINT combine and, you know, we do stuff in training and software and yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, and if this is something you can't talk about, just, just say, um, so you, you actually had a job in the military that was focused on OSINT or you found your, your, that you liked OSINT in the military. And then when you got out, you, you pursued it or both. Right. So no, the, definitely not the role, uh, within the military, but some stuff, uh, sort of led, led me down the path to uh, having to understand it better and get involved in it and then uh really just took a liking to it and and like i said um combined those two worlds from my old world and, you know my old past and the uh the, the time in the military and then um yeah that sort of continued that on and just really took an interest in it and and, and drove it forward from there you have to say hi to my cat in the background cool. <laughs> i was going to ask is that a raccoon or something else in <laughs> australia that's going to kill you because he's sneaking up on you yeah. oh yeah no, no that's one of our little tigers you know we just keep them in the background yeah nice Awesome. Yeah, Aussie Tiger. Yeah, <laughs> nice. And that's T I G A. Not. I mean, that's how you say it in Australia. Oh yeah, right? yeah. Everything's shorter. It's either got an O on the end of it, or you know. <laughs> you guys have the best short like w ways of like shorting and shortening things up. In, in I mean, it just sounds so. Wait, everything's lazy. like so cool. So Jay just call it Jay just call it O instead of O C. No, it'd be like uh, O. John O. Steve O. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. Um, uh, Chris, so you, you have been working on in OSINT for a while, and you do have some commercial tools in there as well. But uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is something that we ask most of our, our uh, interviewees, what do you like doing? You know, for me, 
in OSINT, I love usernames. I love like finding like cool stuff, like beer, just beer drinking apps and stuff. But what like, what like gets you into OSINT and, and captures your attention? Yeah, yeah. So for me, one of the biggest things is, is what we can do around uh, geofencing. And something that's always interests me is, um, you know, the concept that every human's a sensor. So, you know, what situational awareness can we get and learn from other people? And then how do we put all that together? So, um, you know, a lot of these platforms uh, have restrictions around geo stuff, and I think that's important. Uh, but the ones that, that don't and people who are willing to share their stuff, how can that be used, you know, for, for you know, for good, you know, and even things like snap map and, and those sort of things that, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that can come from those uh, that I, I find really fascinating. And then it's not just getting information for me. The next, the next part is how do we drive context from it? Because all that stuff, people always focus on um, uh, where people are. I'm more interested in why they're there, what is happening and, and how can we you know leverage that for, for better understanding to actually create intelligence. Right. So, you told me you like the geofencing stuff, but um, don't you find it that it gets more and more difficult to get geofencing information for OSINT purposes? What's your vision on it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So uh, I guess I could branch that out. We've got geofencing, but then geo-related activity. So, I mean, even if you look at the way uh, Twitter works with um, geocoding for... Uh, you know, geotag posts, but then they've got geo places for associated information. And it, it's not, you know, for me, not looking beyond just putting a bubble around somewhere and, and hoping the platform gives you, uh, you know, results because someone's tagged it. It's all the other things where you can apply your advanced searching to, to get geo associated information to drive that into the same discussion or the same investigation. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of sort of context there uh, that is outside of what the platforms may provide based on what people are talking about and you know that's that next step in the investigation that i find uh, quite fascinating and how that information can be aggregated and pulled together and for those of you that are first timers to osint or to the broadcast just so you know like geofencing is is a is a way of bound, putting a bounding box around a certain area uh so if i was looking for all the things that are happening in london i would essentially put a a, a latitude longitude box around london and then i would pull uh, whatever types of social media usually or other types of content that is tagged to a certain geolocation however we did see just this past week um that and i i'm not sure we're going to talk about it in the news section didn't we see that there's other ways to to do geolocation more by like what icons people are using or what what other types of um Nico, you were talking to me about this. You know what what uh, what emojis they're using are is oh, yeah. tagged to certain groups or different regions. Yeah, well, right? I did some research on on the usage of emojis based by country, basically. And sometimes when it's large countries, so the Netherlands is a fairly small country, so it's really hard to dissect the Netherlands in. Um, sub provinces but when you look at for instance the united states it's a fairly big country and you can see differences in usage of emojis in certain states for instance which could tell which could be a tell where someone's from so yeah, yeah so and we don't always in, need the latitude longitude go ahead chris so i was just going to say and uh, exactly like nico is saying things around you know what's the vernacular you know and all those sort of local colloquialisms and how that ties together so there's you know and, and that's a lot to it and then even going into the image analysis you know what people wearing all those sort of things like it's all those little details i think can 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 tie into uh when i say geofencing it's probably better described as geo associated activity um because something we always sort of talk about is uh, when you're doing any of this sort of work, set limitations and you know, have clear direction on what you're trying to achieve because it's a hell of a rabbit hole out there. So, um, so and yeah. this is sort of one way to, to do that. And uh, yeah, that's just something that we found, you know, I find particularly interesting. So, do you also corroborate uh, temporal uh, information in that? So, for instance, uh, the seasons of the year or maybe local specific temporal, uh, maybe an artist giving an, uh, uh, a concert or something, which is also basically a geofencing information, or is that something that you don't do? No, no definitely. Uh, I, I think could probably do that better i think that's why you know continue to, to learn that stuff and and understand it better so um but all that is, is exactly right like it's it's just it's key it's uh it's associated so um so yeah i need, need to sort of uh expand that out a bit more i think and yeah 
that's why I love the OSINT community because everyone's got great ideas and great things they can put in and, and, and we love sharing that out as well because it's, uh, it, it really is um, uh, a I lot agree. to learn. Every day is something new. Yeah. Can I also ask you, um, have you also done or are you interested also in modeling? So trying to map out certain areas. For instance, let's, let's take the COVID crisis as an example where you try to map out um, where high concentration of people are that are at high risk in a certain area based on various factors. Have you done anything? No, not not at scale. So not um not from a, a data aggregation point of view and you know, big data and analysis. I I find that super interesting as well. You know, uh, yeah. taking all that information and then and then exactly how do you model it out? So no, not us, but definitely super interested and keen to do that. It's it's you know trying to find the time and the tools and the data to get it done. So um so yeah, always keen to collaborate on anything in that space as well. So, Chris, uh, one of the things that you were just mentioning about sharing information in the community and all, um, it brought me back to your talk recently at the OSIN Summit uh, in, in February last month when we were not quarantined and we all got together <laughs> in a large group and we felt good about it. That um, feels like other, last year. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. It, God. Um, but, but Chris, one of the neat things that, about your talk that I really took away, well, well first off, would you mind telling a little bit about the talk that you did? But but before you get that and get there, one of the things I really liked about the talk it w is it wasn't just here's a website, here's a tool that does this, it's magic. It's you actually uh, did a really great uh, kind of progression of 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 truly like training us within you know the short thirty five minute slot that you had on how to do things and different ways to achieve the same type of goal. So would you mind like sharing a little bit about what your talk was about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the talk was about uh, engagement cluster analysis or just in looking at engagement metrics as the, um, the key focal point for understanding associates. So rather than looking at a friends and a friends list, you know, we sort of looked at uh, how often people are liking or commenting or whatever the engagement metric is for that social media platform. And because these platforms are, you know, they, they rely on that obviously for ad revenue and marketing, you know, those things need to exist by sheer nature. So how can we leverage those to, to really understand who's engaged? So, you know, and that's what I liked about uh, with the talk is rather than like you're saying, focusing on a tool set, let's look at the process and the principles because then when a new platform comes up, we can then apply that same concept. We just need to go and figure out how the website's built and we can go pull that apart. So, you know, we hit TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, all using very different methods and, uh, you know, particularly two of them are, are very closed off, you know, in, uh, in, in some, some way or form. So um, that, that's what we looked at and, and sort of touched on uh, how to do it manually uh, in Facebook. Then we looked at how you can use some third party tools for efficiencies in Instagram and then TikTok jumping into the command line, just a different uh, approach and, and getting a bit old school with some Excel formulas just to get that, let, let's worry about the data and we can visualize and make that pretty later. So, um, yeah, that was one of the things. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. Um, and, and I love the fact that like the techniques that you were showing, uh, were ones that people just needed a spreadsheet application to do. It wasn't any magical PHP or Python or, or some $20,000 a year tool. It was, Okay, so Excel is a little bit expensive, but you could use <laughs> LibreOffice or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was really, it was really accessible. I think the techniques that you showed, and I appreciated that. For those yeah, interested, yeah. I will put a link in, to the talk into the show notes, and for those live attending now, I put a link in the chat box. Yeah, thanks, Nico. And the other, the other thing was the um, once the principle is done, you know, people who who can code or do have those skill sets, they can create efficiencies by then extending that, right? So, you know, it, like you said, makes it accessible, but then gives a, a jump platform for the next step, which is to, to really branch that out with efficiency, so. So, so tell us a little bit about that, because one of the things that we, you know, I hear a lot of is, I want to learn Python so that I can OSINT better. And, and I'm, I, I, I constantly say, and, and other people here, you know, t and tell me what you think too. I always say, yes, you could use a Python, but you have to get the underlying core of what you want to achieve down first, and then you use the Python to make that faster or grab more data faster. Are you finding that, it, that that's what you mean by efficiencies is just doing it by automated fashion and faster? Absolutely. So just building tools around your processes so you can spend less time collecting and more time analyzing. And, you know, that's what we should all be doing if we're trying to, you know, 
turn our, uh, if, uh, PAI or whatever we're getting into actual intelligence is, you know, we've got to focus on the, the analytics part. So, or the analysis part. So, um, so yeah, that's, you know, I mean, I'm not a Python guy. I'm a, I'm a JavaScript guy and that's why I do a lot of sort of, uh, uh web interface tools. I, I like what can be done around, um, you know, GUIs and making it easy and simple and presenting the data. Uh, but yeah, that's what I mean by efficiencies is, is pushing those tool sets out to hit the processes. Cool. Just on the subject of that, Chris, you mentioned um, about at the start and just now about, about how you turn that raw information into intelligence and it actually becomes useful OSINT. Um, apart from the tools, can, can you tell us a bit about sort of the process that you do that? How do you evaluate things? How do you give weight to things? That sort of stuff. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, leaning on the, the, the traditional you know, Intel cycle that everyone's sort of um, uh, focused on, but the, the hardest part around the analysis I find for in the OSINT space is uh, verification and validation. So multi-source, you know, uh, trustworthiness of the source, and, and and even that can be subjective, right? Um, mm. And there's there's a, a a real risk in using tools for validation or verification. You know, there's some some great aggregation tools looking at trustworthiness of, of Twitter. You know, like Bot Sentinel and and some of those things. But having to interrogate that that data yourself is, is probably one of the key things, but also uh, extremely challenging at scale. So, so I mean, I, again, you know, going back to the tooling side, if you can build your own tool sets on the fly to, to really uh, get that data where you know what the source is and then you can validate where that's coming from, then um, tying that into your analysis is, is, um, is key. And then it's going to give you more time to, to go through that process. Um, I definitely think it's so it's subjective or, you know, situational dependent uh, for where or what you're looking at, you know, whether it's COVID-19 this week or you're looking at an individual specifically, uh, depending on the context, uh, what you have available to validate that is going to be key as well. So, you know, not just, um, you know, weight and volume, it's, it's, it's what is actually there that you have access to. And then, OSINT is only one side of it, right? I mean, we should always be trying to fuse this in, in a true intelligent uh, Intel sense with with other forms. So, uh, and who knows what you get access to and, and, and what you can do. So, um, yeah, I think that's just generally just part of the process and, and um, you know, just staying, staying curious and investigative the whole way along. Nice. So you mentioned a bunch of things there from process to the fact that OSINT is usually the vehicle by which uh, people find the information and the analysis to support a larger investigation or a larger intelligence product as well. Um, great points there, Chris. Great points. Other people have questions for Chris? If not, I'll keep talking with them. No, I just wanted to add uh, one more point because I think Nick's Intel also pointed it out, the, the importance of analysis because I think sometimes this just gets overlooked. And then often you hear about Python script here, GitHub script here, GitHub script there. And it's nice to have some tools like that that can help you with the collection. But when you think about the like, intelligence cycle, um, this is just one part of the cycle. And if you really want, if you want to turn some unstructured data into intelligence, um, then, of course, the analysis is very crucial here. And then also validation, verifying the sources, the, rel the reliability of sources is so important. Yeah, that is, is extremely important, Laurent. It, um, one of the things that, that we're always talking about is the difference between tools, techniques, and actually it, the yeah. int part of OSINT. Um, the intelligence putting the why, why does this matter? Why do I care? And is this truthful, accurate? Um, that type of stuff in there as well is very, very important. Thanks, Lauren. All right, Ray? I was just gonna say, if you can't tell the story um, to someone who doesn't have any idea what you have looked into, what you have found, you, you have to be able to tell the story for any of it to matter. Yeah, you do. I mean, it, and and the story is is uh, putting the pieces together, or it could be abstracting it, depending upon where you're publishing. Um, absolutely. So, Chris, uh, one of the things that we always uh, like to talk to, about with our uh, interviewees is, what's your favorite beer? No, no, don't don't tell me your favorite <laughs> beer. We already know that information from your untapped. Um, no, what is uh, what's something that you're looking to learn in the coming? days, weeks, months, years, what's something that you, you have said, you know, gosh, I know JavaScript really well and I can make all these cool things and geofence, but I don't know about that. And I really am interested in it. 
it's the uh, it, I think it's some of the stuff that uh, yeah, Next Intel keeps, it keeps putting out with the the uh, image analysis or, or MN, you know, like uh, getting the information. It, it sort of ties into what we're talking about. It's all very good to get the information, but uh, some of the really cool stuff about how how you're sort of associating and geofining and uh, I can't remember um, one of the posts I saw this week as well was around um, uh, the finding McAfee. Yeah, I just find yeah, that, that really interesting. That. Yeah, so I just uh, something uh, I haven't spent a lot of time on. I really want to sort of sink my teeth into uh, when I get when I get a chance because fantastic skill set and uh, and even that goes back to the start of uh, geo geo associated stuff. I mean, you, you can't hide from a photo if, if you have those sort of skill sets. So I, I just find that interesting. So yeah, hoping to get some time to to, to really get into that and and learn from from some of the great stuff that's out there. Next. You gonna offer us a, a training class here? How to be like <laughs> awesome in uh, uh, image intelligence? <laughs> Maybe. I, uh, all, in all seriousness, now we have all this time that we're shut in our houses for twenty four seven. Um, I'm starting to think about putting something together online. So watch this space. Okay. Awesome. Cool. I'll be there. Well, we actually have something about people showing the insides of their houses uh, in, in our news segment. Oh and, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, and does anybody else have any last questions for Chris before we transition to the news? No? Uh, not for now, no. Well, all right. Well, thank you so much, Chris uh, Poulter, uh, OSIN Combine, for, for uh, being on here. And please stick around, and let's go ahead and uh, talk about some news things. First news thing that we're going to talk about is... Chris's Twitter profile, just so that you can uh, check it out. He shares not only a lot of OSINT stuff, but a lot of uh, tools, techniques, and just interesting things out there. So check him yeah. out at twitter.com slash OSINT Combine. And on his website, OSINT Combine, he has not only training, but this whole section over here on free tools, some really, really neat stuff in there. Thanks for uh, sharing that stuff out, Chris. All right. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. So let's get into the news. And first thing we're going to do is talk about this corporate reconnaissance thing. Uh, I think we have somebody on the line here that, that maybe can summarize what this blog post is about. Ray, you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I made a blog about um, corporate recon and uh, some of the ways you can gather information. Um, through breach data and several different websites um, using Spiderfoot, uh, basically how you can collect the information that you can then turn into actionable intelligence. Yeah, and I like the way that uh, I think uh, some of the other OSIN Curious members popped in here and and uh, added a little bit of content as well. Uh, I like the way that it's it's not just you know hey you could Google it and all you dive into a couple other sites you do you show some uh, some techniques for gra gathering things that are around the organization whether it's org charts and structure of the organization or like financial filings and when I was looking down this list I was like corporation wiki oh I wonder if she's gonna I wonder if she's going to mention some of these other sites that I really liked. And then there's open corporate. So um, uh, you and the other uh, OSINT Curious people did a really nice job of, of creating this. So thank you. Thanks, Ray. And I think it's kind of one part, like you said before, using all these tools is just one section of it. Uh, you have to be able to take those tools and then actually make something out of it. Um, so maybe I'll do a case study using some of them. Neat. Yeah, that's something that, that we're going to be looking at to, to do more of in the coming year is, is putting OSINT into practice, um, may, harvesting all the things, pythoning them, or, or just using this is great. But actually, how do we use this to achieve some goal? I think that's going to be very important. Thanks, Ray. Let's move on to this one. Uh, by another OSINT Curious member. Nix, tell us about your signs you're following a fake Twitter account blog post on your personal nixintel.info blog. Oh yeah, so um, I came across, there was an argument on Twitter that I was tagged into about um, Wait, argument. there are arguments on Twitter? <laughs> yeah. <isn't that> <laughs> um, uh, anyway, this it, I can't even remember what the issue was now, but it was um, someone tagged me into it and was arguing um, about this polit this particular political argument that was going on and that some of the accounts behind it were fake and they tagged me in it and I had a look. 
Um, and I, I do this sort of thing every so often. I haven't blogged about it before until now, but um, straight away, like the face looked look like one of these faces that we know from this person does not exist, right? We're all quite aware of that site. Um, it's really, really popular for generating fake faces for sock puppet profiles and so on. Um, so I dug into that a little bit. And actually, when you look at all these faces that are generated um, by this person does not exist, they all have these common features around the mouth and the eye position, uh, a few things around the ears and the hair. Uh, and although some of them are really, really realistic, there are these little tells around eye alignment and teeth. Um, so like if you so like the guy in this picture, um, there's a few things with his face, which when you dig into it a little bit more, aren't quite right. Um, and I generated a few other examples on there to show like how people's face, central facial features, their eyes, their nose and mouth are always sort of straight onto the camera. But then when you look at their ears, they're always at a slight angle because like the, just because the way his face generated. Yeah. That guy there, like, I mean, what's up with his ear, right? Yeah. He's got like a little baby ear here. That's so cute. Yeah, I mean, he's an extreme example. But actually, if his if his ear was covered there, it'd be, it'd be quite hard to tell. Um, but yeah, so his hat is really ill fitting there too. It's really weird yeah. on the other side. Yeah, um, and some but some of these are really really good. And and the one in the in the Twitter account I wrote about was was actually not too bad as far as fakes go. But um, yeah, then I sort of went from there. Thought well, like my gut is telling me that this is probably fake. And we looked at some of the facial stuff and then dug into sort of the behavior around it. So this guy was claiming to be from, uh, I think he was claiming to be a lawyer in New York, but originally from Manchester in England. So digging to when he tweets, how he tweets, how old his account is, and conclude that this guy is, is probably a, he might not be a bot necessarily, he might not be automated, but he's certainly a fake account who seems to be created purely for amplifying um, the, the particular political message. But it shows if you dig beneath the surface behind some of these accounts, um, you can actually find out quite an awful lot about them. Yeah. Thanks, Nix. Yeah, the, uh, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of people using the this person does not exist uh, faces mm. all over the internet uh, for, for their accounts. And some of them are just looking to be more private. So they're using yeah. that instead of their real faces. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is helpful. It's one of those pieces that tells us that this may be a fake account. So Nick, so I, had a, I had a question on that too, because I, I thought this sure. was really interesting, particularly from um, people setting up personas or sock puppets, but then on the platforms they're doing it on, what algorithms are they doing uh, on, the, on the platforms to detect these images to see if they're fake, right? Uh, to, to then put into, um, to, to deny or ask for more verification. Are you seeing or have you seen any automated tools or, um, or tools that are available to analyze these images in the same way you've sort of gone through the manual process there uh, that, that people with, without sort of those um, imminent skills can, can really just run, run through and say, oh, what's you know, the confidence score that this is real or is fake? Um, I'm not, there may be some tools out there that can do that. I'm not aware of any, um, <clears throat> I mean, with there are, cause there are several different programs that are generating these images and some of them are better than others. And each one seems to be unique in the way that it generates a fake image. So they're all slightly different. Um, yeah. and I have, without giving too much away, I, I have managed to create plenty of sock puppets accounts with these profile pictures and never had an issue. Um, the issue with these um pro photos i would foresee is a because they probably are for someone who can write the software they probably are detectable because of the eyes the nose mouth position but then again there are thousands of real photos that would always have those same characteristics so yeah sure i, I don't i don't know how you how you so so i've always thought about it and and this is what i've been telling people is that when you are using when you are using a photo for a research account or sock puppet or synthetic identity, you need to make that photo look as close to something that would come off of your phone as possible. When I take a picture of myself with my iPhone, whatever, there's metadata in there, there's the file name, and all of these other bits that when I upload it to Facebook, Facebook goes, yup, that's a, from an iPhone, that, that's consistent with what Micah uses, yup, that is a file format. But when you download things from like, uh, this person does not exist, it saves the file as image.jpg. And like, that's absolutely a tell. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you upload image.jpg of a face um, without 
the metadata that comes from normal cameras to Facebook, whether that increases their like suspicion meter or something, because these are easy things to extract from an yeah. image or from uh, for the file, right? Yeah, and it, it's hard because obviously Facebook and co aren't transparent about how they detect all this face up. It's really difficult, but yeah, I mean, maybe that's something to look at actually. If you dig into the metadata and of behind these files, is you know maybe that is one of the tells. To one of the tells, maybe not for Facebook, but for us as OSINT and curious people, I think is you these people with the fake profiles, they only ever have that one picture of themselves. So you do that reverse image on that, you won't find any matches unless they've used the same picture. Like you won't find that face from any other angles anywhere. And that that is another tell. Whether it whether Facebook and those companies do that as well, I I, I don't know. Um but that, maybe we should experiment with that. Well, one of the things that I was hoping, or I think the evolution of the this person does not exist will be, or I hope if the person that runs this person does not exist uh, is listening, please do this. Create multiple pictures using the same or derived version of the person's face. You know, so you have that front on picture, but also mm -hmm. from the side, maybe at a distance or something like that, so that uh, you can have multiple pictures to, to choose from because some of the platforms have actually started asking for we need another picture with your face in it as well just to do that bot yeah, analysis. I think I've, I've seen some of that um, Facebook in some parts of the world have been trying video verification so you oh, know, really you're sort of filming you're like doing a like a mug shot almost like that where you're filming yourself that oh that's creepy <laughs> I see like 3d modeling coming out yeah. of that that's not gonna be good yeah what Tough what could go wrong right? <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Appreciate that. Appreciate your, your blog post and you sharing that great blog post. I love it, like the details in your blog post. Um, a couple quick uh, news things here. Uh, one, um, uh, Matthias Wilson, uh, MW Wilson, who's online but not speaking today, uh, mentioned that the DeepL language translator site is now doing Chinese and Japanese translation in addition to the, the languages that it was doing have you, have any of you uh, seen curious people you use DeepL as opposed to like Google Bing or uh, a translator Kirby? I know that you do a bunch of things um, with uh, with with different languages, but I know that you're also very fluent in them. Have you ever used DeepL? I have not used DeepL yet on my to do list. Me too. Nico and Laura. Yeah. Yeah, I used um, I've used it for Arabic languages and Chinese, and in my experience, for those languages, they are better than Bing and Google have to offer. Yes, absolutely. So, I can confirm that, especially um, also for those who are interested in translating stuff from German to English or English to German. I also used it quite often uh, when I was translating an article. Now I couldn't be bothered to translate it myself, so I used <laughs> copy paste. Uh, to be honest, it was really really good. And okay. I think one of the reasons why it's so good is because they use uh, deep neural networks. And I think, as far as I remember correctly, it was also um, they tried to buy uh, deepl.com, but they refused, I think. So it's really, really good. A lot of people okay. are trying to buy it. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it's always nice to be able to find out that those reliable sites that you've been using like Google Translate and Bing and Yandex Translate are, are okay, but there's something better that is still free. Um, so that's neat. Um, then we have a couple of uh, news items here where people were just Googling things. Uh, did you all see uh, this where people were, now that a lot more people are using online kind of meetings like Zooms and all, do you, th uh, people are sh starting to share those Zoom, those Skype, those Google Hangouts online. Have you seen that that, that yeah. those are Googleable, Nico? Well, I played around with this because no. I, I was. Um, what do you mean? Were you well, attending other people's meetings, Nico? <laughs> yes, I did. Blink well, twice. Yeah. No, for real, I did. I oh. just popped. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I am I just, now on the board I, of five different companies. I just popped in and out just to see if I could get in because people would share uh, Zoom links, uh, GoToMeeting links, WhatsApp links, just because they had their morning stand-ups now doing virtually. And I was just like, well, they're sharing it. So I was looking at, um, my technique was looking at different time zones around eight and uh, between eight and nine o'clock in the morning because that's when people come in the office and do the, the, the morning stand up or the morning briefing. And then you'll see those links get shared on whatever. 
you will see it on you'll see it on Twitter, you'll see it on Facebook, you'll see it on Instagram. People just share those links where they uh, think their people are at, but they are not aware of well, Nico might pop in. <laughs> no, no, honestly, it's 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 yeah. it's amazing what uh, because um, initially there is no risk because it's just a URL, right? I cannot tell from the URL uh, whose meeting it is or whose company it is, but I can see the person who posted uh, the URL, and I can do a little bit of OSINT reconnaissance around that person, and then I could get a better understanding or or. or about what it might be. So um, I'm not having that much of a success of actually getting in rooms and making them aware, just dropping a link. Well, hey, maybe it's not that smart to pop open these links uh, all on the open, but um, well, it could be done. I well, and you think about the, man, and the amount of uh, theft of data, the private information, the proprietary information. Uh, when we had people that used to leave, leave our companies, we would always change our, our dial-in conference code numbers because we didn't want them to dial back into the call and listen yeah. to all of our proprietary data. But here, we're, we're sharing stuff. And, and how often do you get somebody on your Zoom call or go-to meeting or whatever, and you hear the boo doop or something like that, and you're like, hmm, who's that? And, and somebody's like, hey, sure, huh? Oh, oh, well, we're having trouble hearing you, but just hang on. Just mute your mic. And you're like, all right, cool. And now you've got some random person on there. Not saying it happens, but why not? Why wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a crazy world out there nowadays. So speaking of crazy worlds and something that we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, hey, hold up. I have a question from okay. the audience. Go yeah. um, so going back to talking about the zoom videos that stuff when you're searching them online uh someone wants to know can you res can you restrict how viewable past group chat videos like twitter zoom etc can are when they're searched online i mean my answer would be that this is just a link to get into them if they if it's not live then you can't get into it right yeah things like zoom video you actually as the administrator of the account have to go in pull that video out or make it searchable or like you have to publish it um yeah, and th th there's one difference. I noticed a lot of schools now doing um, Google Meet or Google Hangouts, and then you only need an access code. And you see uh, schools uh, or uh, students sharing only the access code for the Meet session. And they use that exact same code every day to join their class or classroom. So yeah. that's something that's... So could make you film. I think the question is is about the the record the meetings afterwards after they're recorded ah, okay. if they're recorded. Yeah. Right, Kirby? Okay. Right, and I think that that isn't accessible from the join link. I believe you're correct. Yep. Although there may be other links to like, you know, the the recorded versions and uh, that might be an interesting Google dork to see if that's out there. And uh, also just to add to that uh, cuz I think um you know, in order to find these join links or generally like this can be join link for any kind of service, you need to put it out there somewhere. So Google or other search engines index it. So if it's not indexed, you can't search it via these search engines. So this is also something to consider. Uh, so be aware of, you know, sharing these kind of links. Yeah, and I wonder if like Google and Bing and Yandex are going to start, you know, uh, blacklisting those yeah. types of invite links. That would be a really simple fix for it. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks to, for answering, for asking that question, whomever of our attendees asked it. Let's go ahead and talk about something that SANS is doing, but people have been doing this type of thing for a long time. SANS actually cr tried to create the longest hashtag ever, uh, SANS train from home challenge. And what they're asking people to do is uh, go ahead and tweet out pictures of their battle stations. What is that computer that you're using to, to learn off of? What does your room look like? Whatever. And uh, here we have some pictures uh, from the SANS blog. This is Phil Hagen's place. See this little, you know, Star Wars thing? It is Star Wars, right? Not Star Lego. Trek. Yeah. yeah, okay. It's a Millennium Falcon, right? But look at this. I mean, take a look at what's in these pictures. You see, I mean, as an OSINT, as OSINT people, I want you to tell me what are some things right off the bat that you see here that you say, okay, Phil Hagen is blah. I'm going to steal his Apple computer. Okay, but what kind of Apple computer is it? <laughs> yes. First, first gen. It, it is yeah. an Apple IIe, yes, with yeah. the dual disk drives and the monochrome screen. Yeah. What else do you see? The metals. Uh, metals. The metals. What are the metals for? 
Do you know? I don't know. I'd have to zoom in, but I'm going to guess they're running. They are running metals. That's right. So one, Phil likes uh, Apple products. We also see an Apple on his desk, a Mac on his desk. We got running things. What else do you see here? Well, I can clearly see uh, his screens and probably when I zoom in his operating systems and the notes from his notebook. Yep. There's a lot, a lot of tales in here. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And so um, when Sans, uh, Nico, you actually were on this email too, and Sans said, hey, we want people to send out and share information from inside their home. Um, I think, Nico, you were like, no. <laughs> yeah, I made a or, tweet about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things is, is that we do ask that you sanitize things like this is the desk I'm actually sitting at right now and, and the light that I'm using right now. And it gives away a lot of information about me, but it also has some things like pictures of my family kind of uh, uh, blurred out and the desk is, is sanitized um, to some degree. So if you do do a challenge like this or you're just doing one of those, hey, look at me, I'm setting up working from home, please make sure to sanitize your pictures before you send them up to social media. Um, it will help out. Uh, or you're providing a whole bunch of information for us to analyze, and we will look at your information. Well, it has all. been an amazing week last week, <laughs> looking at everybody's well, desk, right? Yeah. Uh, was it you that were looking at? No, it was somebody else that was looking on. Uh, Mat Matthias was looking on, like, Instagram and other things to see, you know, the hashtag work from home or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I think he said there was a huge amount of information people were sharing. Did you find it too, Nico? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so funny to see. But also, it's also, uh, you see s companies being exposed by their employees that they're literally not aware of what they're exposing. So it's facepalm after facepalm after facepalm, and they uh -huh. don't even know they are posing a real threat to even their homes. Because keep in mind, we are now all, uh, due to quarantine, at home. And we share pictures from in our own, but we also share pictures from maybe really valuable goods that a burglar is interested in. So yeah. now you're sharing these pictures and in a month or maybe two months, we are all allowed out. And the burglar just now has now needs to build his own <laughs> database and check I off. Love, where. I love the way you think that like burglars are like, man, there's COVID-19 out there. I'm sticking in until that <laughs> stuff is gone. Then I'm going to start robbing people. Yeah. <laughs> that, all right. Well, yeah, that's, that could work. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the burglars won't go out because they know we're all in our houses right now. Right? Yeah, well, that's so. my point, right? And, well, now they only need to index what they can grab because we are all sharing pictures from inside our homes. Right. Yeah. All right. So if you do share stuff uh, for the work at home challenge or the battle stations or whatever, sanitize your stuff or you will be publicly analyzed by Nico and our cast of hundreds. Um, also, Matthias did hit us up in the chat saying that uh, after he mentioned to some people that you might not want to publish this because you have a post-it note of the Wi-Fi password or whatever on your thing, uh, people were starting to take stuff down. So um, good for them. Thank you, Matthias, for making this world a little bit better of a place. Now, I'm going to go ahead and shift back to our wonderful guest, Chris Poulter, uh, and just say a huge, huge thank you. Uh, many of you are, are familiar with the uh, checkuser.org, name check, and those types of, or noem.com websites for checking usernames. I've maintained a project for many uh, years, and it's called What's My Name? It's kind of more of a behind the scenes project until now, because this project required you to um, go ahead and use a tool like Recon NG or Spiderfoot. It wasn't a web page until Chris Poulter came around. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right, yeah, and like, what What did it take you, Chris? Like a day to code this or like two hours? Come on. Uh, yeah, we, we whipped it together yesterday, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, you just amaze me. So what is this? Go to whatsmyname.app.app and you type in a username like, oh, let's go ahead and look you up, Chris. Oh, Sync Combine, you go ahead and click on that. And what it'll do is it will make calls from your local system. This is not some server where he's harvesting your data or tracking things. Everything is in your browser. Your browser makes over 190 different web calls out there, pulls back places where that user's name is found on some site. And then 
you go ahead and take a look at it. Um, and it's using it on the back end, the what's my name project that I created in order to, to have that, that information. So uh, Chris, uh, there were a couple other points that you wanted to stress to the people. I'll go ahead and search for myself. Do you wanna tell any of the other points about this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the, the the way you've got that. Uh, you know, your what's my name project with the with the JSON data. So you can filter via um, uh, category before going in there. So um, so on the on the top right hand corner, if you're just trying to narrow down on on accounts on a particular uh, topic, and and that's all because of of what Micah and and the other authors at the top there have, have put together over the years. So um so yeah, definitely filter on that. And then the other ones in the table. So uh, if you're Obviously, getting the default ones on the left, but on the right, if you you can trim in that dynamic search bar just for you know different aspects, and you can narrow that down. So it's just, just trying to create efficiencies again uh, with 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 searching and finding stuff. Uh, so a couple of things coming out, you'll be able to preview accounts and and uh, export that out to CSV. Some feedback from from um, from Nico and and some other stuff. But yeah, man, just thanks very much for uh, the opportunity to sort of uh, tap into this. Uh, you know, it's always been a, a great resource, that JSON packet. And now it's, uh, if we can get it out to the public and give it for free, then um, I think that's great. So yeah, try to support the community. Can I add, I absolutely really appreciate this because I have a lot of clients who, yeah, they probably could do some Python coding if they had time, but they have things to go on. We, they really need a GUI. And this is so nice to actually see Micah's project that I know ha is like constantly updated because some of these other username search engines, they mm -hmm. throw against the wall and never update. But this is constantly updated and other people can come in and update it as well. Um, it's really, I really, really appreciate both Micah, all the uh, people who created it and OSINT combined for this. Um, I do have a question. Does what's my name work in the EU as well? So, uh, well, yeah, about the Micah. Yeah, you want me to take that since it's uh, not a UI question? Um, so the answer is yes and no. Uh, the what's my name project? It actually is built off of GitHub.com slash WebReacher slash what's my name. Um, so this is the actual main site and this JSON file is what uh, Chris's project and other projects pull stuff from. And as you can see here, we, we pull a certain URL and then we substitute account names in there and then check for what's my name to actually found a user account on a website. That URL to the user's profile like twitter.com slash webreacher, the username webreacher is in the URL and we have to know about it. So if there's sites out there that you're like, ooh, the UR username's in the URL and it's not in here, you can go to the What's My Name project here and go up to the top, create an account, go up to the top and hit issues and then hit new issue and add that site. Say, hey, I want, you know, whatever dot wherever and here's the URL that you can use to test and we'll go ahead and create uh, a, a thing for you. And then once we create it, it'll automatically show up in Chris's wonderful UI and you will have made the world a better place. There's yes. one, there's one thing I, I really want to add. I've seen a lot of people using tools like this and they, uh, well, they get those hits, those, let's say, let's say there's green boxes and they automatically assume that that is the account tied to, for instance, you, Mike, a web reacher always check and double check on the original source if you can uh, confirm that that's the actual person. This is just a hit on a username, not the actual person. So it just- Right, some usernames are yeah. multiples. Hey, I, had a, I have a request for Chris though. Is there a way that we can get a link on that tool directly to the place where you can submit sites? Like Chris uh, yeah. a little- Yeah, yeah because yeah. awesome. Because I'm gonna be teaching my people how to submit sites. Nice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that's a cool suggestion, and and then even uh, back on yours as well, Nico. So the um, uh, someone trying to build it is just you can hover over the little box, and it'll, it'll just show you what was actually pulled. So rather than having to open up new tabs to go to each account, you'll just be able to do it quickly. So if you can turn a, a one hour task into a you know a thirty minute task and validate that information, hopefully we can get that done. Um, but the other side as well for the, for this tool, you know, uh, which a bit of a differentiator of some of the other platforms as well is, is no ads. You know, there's, there's no tracking data on the back. It's, it's very flat. And, uh, and that's why we stuck it on a, a, a separate domain rather than, you know, our own individual websites, which obviously, you know, have, have uh, stuff on them uh, for, for uh, web analysis. So, so yeah. 
And I do want to let you know, just as we transition off to other things, that uh, the well, let me stop sharing here real quick. The the um, you will get false positives on this. The reason is that. Uh, your system is going to be making the web calls. Some of the websites that the What's My Name project checks for usernames are pornog pornography sites like Pornhub.com and, and some other ones. Because if our users, our target has a fuzzy bunny one, two, three user account on Twitter and is the head of some bank somewhere and also uses fuzzy bunny one, two, three on some, some sensitive websites like sexual deviant or pornographic websites, and you can easily connect those two, we'd want to know that for a lot of our investigations. So it does have some... Uh, some categories that you might want to not use. And that's where the, the search by category uh, that Chris showed us or that, that uh, we showed at the top uh, comes into play. Cool. Thank you again, Chris. You have my thanks and buying you a Foster's. Oh, is that Canadian? <laughs> uh, I'm buying you something when, next time we see each other. Please don't. Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> no Foster's. All right. Uh, let's talk about this real quick. We've got, uh, I know that we have at least one of the Trace Labs members out there uh, in our audience. We have the Trace Labs missing CTF uh, for the global missing CTF for coming up in just a couple of weeks uh, in on April 11th. It's ten dollars to subscribe to go ahead and sign in, and to become uh, to be involved in that event. And these events do fill up quickly. Um, does anybody want to just briefly explain what the missing CTF is? Or shall I? Yeah, I'll go. I um I did on these uh, last year. Um, so basically, um, it's you're working either on your own or as a team, and you're presented with a load of real life missing people cases. So it's not a fictional capture the flag. It's all real people, real cases. Uh, and your job is to find as much open source information about them as possible. And for the, when you find the information, be that like a date of birth or their car registration or where they were last seen or something like that, uh, you submit that to the team. It's uh, given points and whoever gets the most points at the end of it all wins. But it, it's a competition, but it's all about learning and taking part so you can learn an awful lot in a short amount of time by doing it. Cool. And I'd like to add, I've done a few of these and I've judged and it's, uh, there's really a low barrier of entry. If you're new to OSINT, um, it's a great place to start and you have a team that you can work with. This is actually how I started in OSINT. Um, I played at layer eight. So I think it's a really good place to start uh, honing your skills or to, to find out if you're really interested in OSINT. Absolutely right. Absolutely, and thanks, Nick, Nick, for saying that. Um, if you don't know how to do OSINT and, and you're interested in this, uh, just keep in mind that all of the tips that you submit, all the tips that other people submit around the world are going to be given to law enforcement, and they're going to try to help find these people that are missing. And so anything that you can do is helpful. In fact, one of the things that we did back in the last Missing CTF was we talked to, uh, well, somebody, I had somebody come up to me and said, hey, you know, listen, I only found a couple of things. We didn't win. But the reality is, is that the things that you find and the tips that you find may be the ones that other people haven't found. And those could be the ones that could help uh, find uh, different people. So uh, check out tracelabs.org for all of the information. They also have their own Slack and um, resources as well. Also on the OSINT Curious website, we do have um, Ritu Gil and I, who went and made a really cool uh, intro to OSINT video. She did most of the work, I just did a voiceover. All right, for this next section, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna introduce this uh, Laurent Bodo uh, piece here, and then I'm gonna let him talk, and then I'm gonna let uh, Laurent, if you wanna just take screen sharing when you're ready, and, yeah. and uh, Go for it. Uh, you're currently sharing. I am currently sharing. So you want to tell them a little bit about this and then I will. Yeah, uh... sure. Um, so yeah, I basically started yesterday. I had the idea. I mean, I'm at home anyways and I was just working on some other stuff. But um, recently I got really interested in the kind of like idea of doing more research into mis and disinformation. And given the current situation and the importance of kind of fighting misinformation, um, I thought about like creating a Slack 
and then inviting literally everyone who's interested in supporting this kind of uh, fight against misin disinformation. Um, yep. Yeah, just to show you a couple of resources. So the idea was to kind of like invite everyone and have this kind of awesome community on Slack. And uh, so the main goal is to identify and debunk mis and disinformation in the context of COVID-19. As I said, it's very important. So I also thought this might be a good opportunity for some that are just started in uh, OSINT. So I pulled together a bunch of resources that I've come across over the, the years as well, and also months, some basic and some uh, really advanced stuff as well. So just to show you this course, I tweeted about this a couple of weeks ago. It's really good. Uh, it's by Reuters News Agency, and it's about uh, how to identify and tackle manipulated media. Uh, just to show you uh, the, the chapter. So it starts off with um, lots of interesting things, setting the scene, showing you how to identify deep fakes and how you can tackle the manipulated media. So this is really good to just get the basics right. Um, another resource is uh, this year, First Draft News, the organization itself is really, really worth uh, following. I just wanted to point out, because we usually talk about fake news or myth and disinformation, but they actually put it into seven really useful categories to differentiate between the different types of myth and disinformation that you can find here. And by the way, we're gonna put everything into the show notes. Um, this one here, I came across a, a couple of years ago, actually, I think two years ago, um, edited by Craig Silverman, who's now at uh, BuzzFeed News. And this is kind of like the, the basics in verification. So it starts with how you can verify photos and videos. So this is really good. Uh, you can download it for free. And it walks you through also a couple of case studies. It's pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, while I was on Twitter yesterday, uh, someone DM'd me this year as well. It's another really good, useful um, resource. So it's basically how to counter disinformation. And what I like about this is the methodology here. So he talks about detection, qualification, reaction, how to attribute research and also prevention. So it flows really nicely, has also a bunch of useful resources. And um, then here, first draft news again. Um, this is specifically a guide in, uh, with tools for journalists currently working on the COVID case as well. So here they have got the toolbox, uh, dedicated Corona, Google, um, kind of like useful resources as well. So might as well have a look. Um, this year again, verifying online information is like an essential guide, has the basics, uh, it's pretty useful. Um, then here is also the basic toolkit. So I want, you know, there are so many uh, startup me pages, uh, they are all brilliant, but this one is pretty nice and clean. And I think for everyone who just started with OSINT, um, I would suggest using something like this. It's pretty uh, nice, nice overview. And uh, also to just show you a couple of tools that you can use. So whoever is interested in monitoring the kind of like uh, mis and disinformation space currently, uh, this one here um, is pretty good. So this one tracks the, the cases across the world. And uh, coming back to, um, to Chris as well, what you said with geofencing. So um, I find this idea really interesting of like pulling together like the publicly available sources that are out there from the WHO, from countries as well and then plug everything into an ArcGIS dashboard and then display the results. So this is really useful for a lot of people uh, tracking the, the kind of spread. Uh, I find this amazing, it's really good. And this one here in particular is also nice. So a lot of people are probably familiar with CrowdTangle and they made a version free available, which is specifically designed for the COVID-9 live displays. So just to give you a quick example, so you can pick a country here, um, let's go for Germany, and then it should load the, um, the CrowdTangle dashboard, and then you can monitor in near real time, as you can see here on the left side, um, stuff in Germany on Facebook and Instagram, and you can see the stories, how trending they are. So this is particularly useful if you want to identify um, disinformation and misinformation. So on the Slack channel, we've been working on this for uh, since yesterday, and I'm still using it and find even more and more posts that, um, that gain attraction. That's pretty cool. And last but not least, another tool, uh, worth highlighting is this one, the COVID-19, uh, the, the Google Fact Check Explorer. So if you want to fact check something really quick, because um, by no means, I mean, there are so many initiatives that work on this topic and it's really great and they're even fact checking organizations. So having something like this, like Google, that pulls everything together from all the sources, as you can see here, AFP Fact Check, uh, Snoops, and also other um, bunch of uh, resources, you can Google for certain topics and they present you the claim and then also give you the rating. Is this misleading or is it not? So that's also something um, worth <clears throat> having a look. And if anyone's interested in joining the Slack, so I'll keep it up and running. Whoever wants to join, um, please, I can send you the, the Slack link. Or I think someone even posted it right now. Um, 
then please uh, feel free to join and then also have a look at the learning channel. This is where I put even more resources in. Um, and yeah, have a look and come and join us. Awesome. Thanks, Laurent. Appreciate Welcome. that. And with that, we are now in the last section of our show. This is the shameless self-promotion and the overall uh, goodbye section. Um, with that, I do want to mention a couple of things here. First off, the Layer 8 conference, which may be going to a virtual. I think it'll probably go to a virtual. It hasn't been said yet. But Ray Baker, I think you are going to be presenting there, right? Yeah, I will be talking about Maritime OSINT there. Cool. And I also will be presenting on something, something, something there. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I will remember eventually what it is. Um, for me, I have all, all of my classes and Nico's classes have been, uh, the SEC 47 classes have been translated and transferred over to Cybercast. So we are now teaching online classes and it is really cool. And Kirby Plessis, I know that you also have this academy.plessis.net where people can reach you and get some of your excellent training as well. Is that right? Yes, yeah. So every, almost every Thursday, we're going to be doing webinars. I also have, of course, our OSINT News and Resources, which is a curated stream of links. And then if people have the private webinars that we were giving forever, we've actually moved that all online as well. So cool. Yeah. Thanks, Kirby. All right, around the horn really, really quickly. Nico, any last words? No, thank you. Stay safe and stay healthy and stay inside, everybody. Keep posting those pics inside your house. Nick, yes. um, anything before we go? No, except to, I hope everyone stays well and stay inside your house. <laughs> stay well and stay inside your house. Ray Baker. Stay inside your house. And, uh, <laughs> that's all for me. All right, Laurent Bodo. Stay well and inside <laughs> your house and check out uh, Ozen Curious. All book. right, and Kirby. Oh, go ahead. Check out your Ozen Curious and join your, your COVID well. Slack. Right. Now, never mind. I was going to make a joke about it. Has your Slack been tested? But that's that'd be lame. Kirby, <laughs> bless us. Any, any uh, all last right. words? Besides all the great advice given, do something good. Get out there and get active. I mean, not out there, but online. Hey, Chris Bolter. Yeah, Thank you so much uh, for being our guest, buddy. Appreciate no, thanks it. Thanks for having us. And yes, yeah, stay safe, stay informed, everyone. Yep. And uh, for those of you that, that are watching and listening out there, I think we in the OSIN Curious may start doing some informal uh, lunchtime chats where you can join us on the Zoom platform here and just eat lunch with us depending upon where you are in the world, uh, just come and hang out, share your video with us, uh, and share your share screen with us, talk with us, and uh, just open that dialogue, just trying to bring our community a little closer together. I have been your host, Micah Hoffman, and until next time, stay OSINT curious. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Take care, everybody.